All right. Hey, good morning, Mercy Hill. We are going to be uh, finishing up our series called Abide in John chapter 15. So if you have a copy of scripture, you can take it out and turn with me there. Um, If you're newer with us over the last four weeks, this being the fourth, we have been looking at a very poignant metaphor that Jesus Christ used a couple thousand years ago uh, in order to explain who he is and who we can be uh, only through him. And what he said was, I am the vine and you are the branches. What we have been looking at now for this being the fourth week is that this really destroys, I'm going I'm to explain what this means, but it kind of destroys the idea of religion and it gives us the idea of the gospel, okay? Religion basically is the opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear fruit. Religion says, no, 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 no. The way it works is if you can bear fruit, if you can be really good, if you can do everything right, if you can become worthy, then one day you might get the vine, The gospel, though, Jesus says, no, it's the opposite of that. I give you myself when you were unlovable. I loved you when you were unworthy. I uh, I made you worthy in the cross. The gospel is, even though you weren't bearing fruit, I have made you a fruit bearer by abiding in the vine. You don't get the vine because you bear fruit. Uh, bear fruit isn't, bearing fruit is an evidence that you already have the vine. That's sort of what we've been talking about. You know, I thought about it this week. A lot of guys have used an example kind of similar to this, but I think it's very, very good, especially this time of year. You think about springtime, uh, the, you know, the way to think about it is really to think about a garden. I don't know if you guys are gardeners, if you have any kind of garden or you, you plant anything this year. Um, but, you know, like for us, we planted, we planted our garden a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. We have uh, some tomato plants that are growing and doing pretty well. Now, here's the deal. You plant some tomato plants a couple weeks ago. Uh, and if you're me, in a couple months, those vines are going to have tomatoes on them one way or another, okay? Either I'm going to keep the vine alive and there, therefore fruit is going to grow uh, because the vine has access to all the stuff that's in the ground and the branches come off the vine and the fruit comes off the branches. So either I'm going to keep the vine alive and the fruit is going to grow or to save face in front of my kids, I'm going to go out there and staple a bunch of tomatoes on that bad boy, okay? And then about 10 feet away, I'm going to say, look, kids, tomatoes, right? Your daddy's a great gardener and from 10 feet away and for about 10 minutes, It's going to look the same. That's kind of the idea of religion versus the gospel. One is right. The other one looks right. One is alive. The other one looks alive. If we think about an outside in sort of approach, I'm going to do the religious thing. I'm going to get everything dressed up on the outside. You can dress up, but still spiritually speaking, be a corpse. You could be stapling tomatoes on. But what the gospel is, is no, no, no. You don't do the fruit first. You come to me first. You abide first, you go deep there, and I will make you a fruit bearer. Now, that's sort of the idea of the series. Let me get into what we're talking about specifically for today, kind of as we wrap this up. A last dimension of this uh, for the last week, what I want to do is I want to make sure that we spend some time and look outward, okay? I want to make sure that we spend some time and realize that God is not just doing something in us, but there, he's doing something else for the sake of others. When we, when we think about this whole concept of abide and fruit, I think, and maybe this has been true over the last couple of weeks, it can become very touchy-feely, okay? It can become very internalized. It can become very, God is growing me, and he's personally doing a lot of things in me and my family, and that's all true, but we would be missing a major part of John 15 if we didn't also realize what God is doing in us, he's not doing just for us. So this is sort of the main idea that I want to get at here this morning. God bears fruit in us that he might bear fruit through us. Let me be so clear what I mean by fruit. God wants other people to become Christians and walk in the faith and grow and bear fruit in their life because of your witness as a believer. The Christian life is not a pond where we bask in the internalized glories of what God is doing in us and basking in his love for us only to watch other people around us go through life without Jesus. No, God is doing things in us that he might do things through us. So let's get practical today. All right, now this is true if we're here at Regional you're at Clifton Road this morning, it's going to be the same way. All of us are, I know that for Christians, for many of us, even that have walked in the faith for a long time, sometimes sharing Jesus is about the most scary fruit that you can think of that needs to come out of your life. 
Some of us think about it, man, and we're like, man, that's something I know I have to do, but I don't really like to do that, and I'm, I'm not doing real well with it or whatever. Others of you might not even be a believer yet. You're just kind of checking things out. You're here. You're, you're sort of trying to figure out if this is for you, and one of the things that might be keeping you from becoming a believer is you're thinking to yourself, man, I love the internal stuff. I love the joy stuff we've talked about. I love the love stuff we've talked about. I don't really love to share with other people what I believe about Jesus. Part of this, that might be whether you're a Christian or not, you struggle with that. I want you to hear this. That can change today. It can. It can honestly change. Begin today over the course of your life. That can change where it goes from something that scares you to death, something that you feel like you have to do. It can go from a job to a joy. It can go from a duty to a delight. I know at times it might scare you to death to talk about Jesus. Let me ask you something though, and this kind of hopefully will get you thinking about it the right way. Have you ever been scared to death or thought it was a job or a duty to share with someone how awesome your spouse is? Have you ever thought about how, sharing with somebody how awesome your parents were or a great friend of yours or even a professor or a boss that does things the right way? Has it ever scared you to death or you thought, I've got to share this or I've got to have this and I've got to be a, a duty, a joy? Is it a job or is it a joy? You know what? You don't even think about it like that in that category. You know why? Because what our hearts adore, our mouths find a way to talk about. And you say, yeah, but things like my, my spouse and my kids, th- those are, I talk about those things, but they're not controversial. Y'all, we find ways to talk about controversial things. Anyway, if our heart is passionate enough about it, sports figures, news stories, politics, if we're passionate, it can override that fear in our life. And I think the same thing is true with Jesus and evangelism, passion for Jesus and sharing about Jesus. As one rises, the other rises, okay, Ra- raises up. So you may not, you may not believe this yet, I hope by the end of the sermon you will, you can go from sort of dreading the conversation you need to have with somebody about Jesus, you can go from dreading it to loving it, and I think we can get there as we close out this series. All right, so here's what I want to do. I want to walk through a few, uh, a couple verses in John 15. We're going to talk about it, let me circle it a little bit, make sure we understand it, and then we're going to come out uh, with a couple big ideas that we are chosen uh, and we are appointed. And what do those things mean? One is the passion to other flows into what we ought to be doing in the world, all right? Let's dive into John chapter 15. Let's start in verse 15. Here's what it says. No longer do I call you servants, for the servants do not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends, not servants, but friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. All right, now we talked about this a little bit last week, that it is an amazing thing that the God of the universe desires relationship with us. That is just amazing, it should be, that he didn't create robots, nor did he create servants only here, but he created relational creatures that we have the capacity for friendship and relationship and God wants to be that thing that fills that capacity for us. It's truly an amazing thing. I don't know if any of y'all were around the Christian movement then, but it takes me back to college. We used to sing this song, I am a friend of God, okay? We used to jam to that song back in the day. All right, and, uh, but it's, it's that idea. I'm not a robot, I'm not a servant, I'm a friend of God. What Jesus is saying here is something like this. Our status with God is more than a servant. Now, let me, let me be clear, because certainly being obedient and being a servant is part of the Christian life. Um, actually, in the New Testament, you see Paul, James, Peter, Jude, and John all claim to be servants of Christ. So I'm not saying that we aren't servants. I know that we serve God with our obedience. It's just that we aren't less than servants of God, but we are more. And that's kind of what Jesus' point is here. The servant comes in and does a job. The servant is a hired hand. The servant does exactly what you say in order to get the money, okay? The servant is not, the, 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 the employee comes in. There's not a whole lot of vision there. There's not a whole lot of uh, insight there. There's not a whole lot of relational capacity there. There's not a whole lot of love there. It's a I do this and then you do this and then I'm out type of thing. And what the scripture is saying is here is yes, there is an obedience part of our walk with the Lord, but there's also a relationship relational capacity that goes far deeper than a servant. And I I thought about this this week, just in a way to kind of make this maybe click for us and and where we are in the whole picture as Christians, okay? I don't know if some of y'all have heard of this before. Uh, I just was informed this week that there's a new global phenomenon, like every week there's a new global phenomenon, right? So there's a new global phenomenon called glamping, okay? And glamping, some of y'all probably heard of this. Glamping is a mixture, it's basically glamorized Camping is what they do. And people will set you up and you go out and the, the glamorized part of it is 
Yes, you're in the woods, but you're in like the Ritz Carlton of tents, okay? I mean, everything is done for you. You go out there, they have lit the fire for you. At 10 o'clock at night, they bring you a ready-made s'more, okay? There is, there is, there's like hot water and showers, but you're in the woods, and so they call it glamour camping. It's un-American, in my opinion, totally, okay? I mean, the point of camping is what? To be bitten by bugs, be dirty, and not sleep very well, and that's the glamour of it. Ironically, they've taken the glamour out of camping and called it glamorous camping, but that's another story. All right, camping is really, though, this is my point, camping is about friends, right? Camping is about relationships. Camping is about your, uh, your, 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 your family and, and your friends, and you kind of are doing all these things together. Now, this is the idea. Many of you right here today, you have, because you grew up with this or you have this from somewhere, you have an idea of your relationship with Jesus that is way more like glamping than camping, okay? And, and here's why. Because you feel like Jesus is ordering his coffee sitting by the fire, and your role is is to be the hired hand that brings it to him and keep your head down and not get told off because you did something the wrong way. That's your idea of the relationship. What I wanna show you is what the Bible is saying. If you are a friend, you're not bringing Jesus his coffee at 10 o'clock at night. What you are doing is you're sitting down by the fire in order to enjoy the coffee so that you can have a relationship, so that you can uh, be friends. It's not a servant thing. It's a relationship thing, it's a friendship thing, and my question for us is this, is the pattern of our relationship with Jesus, is it servant to master or are we friends? And that's only something that you can wrestle with. I mean, what is your outlook when you think about God in the universe and you and your personal relationship with him? Is it servant to master or are you friends? Listen, God is master, he is Lord. I understand that there's an obedience part of our life, but we're more than that, he's called us to be. An intimate friendship with him, it means connection, it means access. A relationship is different than a job. I'll put it like this. Religion gives you a job. The gospel gives you a relationship. And which one of those is speaking more to what you feel like your connection with the Lord is, all right? Verse 16, you do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. That's gonna be kind of where we end up with this whole thing, chosen, appointed. I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. The scripture says you are chosen. Now I know in Christian circles, and some of you might be newer to the faith and you didn't really realize this is like a debate or whatever, and that's fine. In Christian circles, as soon as people start talking about choosing and who chooses, people can begin to get real funny. Our minds immediately jump to salvation. I want us to take a pause on that and put ourselves back into the shoes of these disciples. When you zoom out for a moment, I I want you to try to put yourself at the table of what's going on. John chapter 13, we kind of start seeing this playing out. Where we are at in the Bible is called the farewell discourse. Jesus is sharing something with his disciples and then he's gonna go to the cross and he's sitting there with these guys and he ends up telling them in John 15 that they should remember that he chose them. Before we jump to something else, put yourself at the table and think about this question. Why is Jesus making sure they know that they didn't choose him, that they didn't choose him and become worthy uh, to be followers of him like would have been traditional for the day, that they choose a rabbi and prove themselves to him. But instead of that, Jesus is reminding them of something here to say to them, I chose you. I thought about this for just five seconds and I realized, man, if I was at the table, if I was there with Jesus, this is what I would be thinking. I'd be thinking something like this. You know, Jesus is doing some weird stuff, right? He just washed our feet and now he's talking about being betrayed, but that's weird Jesus stuff. Jesus does weird stuff all the time. I don't really understand it. If I was at the table and if you were a disciple with me at the table, I think we'd be thinking like this, man, Jesus is talking about being betrayed. That's weird. Not sure why he's washing everybody's feet, but I know this. I know that I'm sitting at the table with that dude who walked on water because I was there. And I know that I'm sitting at the table with that dude who spoke to the waves and they listened to him. I know that Jesus is doing a bunch of stuff, talking about being betrayed and dying and all this stuff, but I don't know about that. What I know is I was there when we have seen countless healings. I was there when we have seen people absolutely raised from the dead. 
Jesus is talking about being betrayed, but here's what I know. Just a couple days ago, Mary and Martha came to us because their brother Lazarus was sick. And Jesus said, I'm not going to go right now. Actually, it was very odd. Jesus said, he's sick, but he's not going to die. But then he said, he is dead. And then he said something about him being asleep. And nobody understood what was happening. But what we did understand was a man that we loved, Lazarus. He died. And Jesus wasn't there. And then Jesus went to the grave, and when he got there, every single person was coming up to him, one after another, saying, Jesus, if you just would have got here earlier. Jesus, if you just would have got here earlier. But they didn't understand what was about to happen, because Jesus spoke into the grave, and Lazarus came back to life and walked out. And Jesus is talking about being betrayed and washing feet and talking about leaving the earth. But all I know is that a couple days ago, we saw Lazarus come back to life. This is my point. And then as we were coming into the city, everybody was crying Hosanna for us. I mean, for him. See? Like, I, I can't imagine how many people we have healed. I mean, Jesus has healed, right? I mean, how many people have we raised to life? I mean, Jesus has raised them to life. And then Jesus looks at everybody at the table and he says, I chose you. Jesus is in a routine position to take a sledgehammer to our pride. We in religion want to say we were worthy, there was something about us, there was a bunch of fruit in our life. And Jesus says, it wasn't fruit, you were unlovable, you were totally unworthy, this is all about me, I chose you. Don't get this twisted. I feel like we can routinely get this twisted because our hearts are wired to say, I've done these things and therefore I am lovable, I am beautiful, I am worthy. No, we are chosen first. And as we are chosen, now God can begin to the process sort of, of making us into those things. But we gotta remember first, and I think Jesus is telling these guys this, and I think he's telling us through him that we didn't really have a thing in the world to do with it, right? He brought us into relationship, he put us in the vine, and now we can go and bear fruit. Look at verse 16, last thing. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus calls us a friend. He chooses us to bear fruit, that we will abide. You know this verse in uh, 16 right here, that whatever you ask in my Father's name, it will be done for you. Many times this trips everybody up, this verse, verse 16, because they think to themselves, well, I'm asking for stuff, I just, and I think it's in the Father's name, but the prayers are going up and the blessings aren't coming down, and I'm not quite sure why. Maybe I'm not praying the right way. No, it's because this verse has nothing to do with cars and careers and lake houses. I don't care that the preachers on TV late at night want you to believe that. It's not that. Look at the immediate context of this verse. He says the same thing in John 15, 7, that when we ask of God, when our words are abiding, when his words abide in us, when we abide in him, he says in John 15, 7, or right here he says, when you ask in the Father's name. Y'all, what is the immediate context of all of this? It's not cars and careers and lake houses and Rolex. What it is, is fruit. That's what he's saying. The whole deal is, whatever I ask in, in the Father's name, he's going to give it to me. He's saying, you ask in accordance with the will of God. If you ask for fruit to come out of your life, fruit will come out of your life. Your life will change and other people's lives will change because your life is changing. And that is a promise right here in the text. When you ask God to bear fruit in your life, to bear fruit through you, he will bear fruit through you. And that is a glorious truth. Because right now today, I know at both of our campuses, across all our services today, every time I say this, both on Thursday and all the way through the day today, I know that there's going to be a ton of people in here that are going through some crazy circumstances. And you think to yourself that the, the, that the way maybe the prosperity teaching or the way that you've read this verse is, if I can muster up faith and ask hard enough, God is going to heal me though I walk through sickness. He may heal you, but I don't know. What I know, what the promise is, is that while you walk through that, if you pray that other people's lives are changed and fruit comes out in their life through what you're going through, it will happen. That you don't have to wonder about that. You know, I know some people have said, and we had a guy on our staff said, man, you know, his father's dealt with just a crazy amount of sickness. And, and somebody in his life literally told him, man, if you would just have more faith and pray harder. Can you imagine something more discouraging than that? And unbiblical, in my opinion. 
You think about all the things that the disciples went through. You think about martyrdom. You think about all of these things. You should have prayed more. No, what we pray is that fruit will come out of our life. And the great thing is that that is what is most valuable and that is also what is promised. That we don't have to, some of you are walking through a crazy situation maybe with your marriage right now and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's gonna work out. I don't know if they're gonna come back. I don't know exactly how it's gonna, I don't know either. I don't know how it will work out. I don't know exactly what God has in terms of his sovereignty and I don't know what they have in terms of rebellion and all those things. But what I know is the way that you walk through it and how you ask God to bear fruit in you and in others, what the scripture says is that is what is most valuable and that is also what is promised. Whatever we ask in his name. When we think about fruit, he will give us. All right, look, I want to go into two things, uh, just kind of sum this whole thing up, all right? Because I told you earlier, we're talking about being chosen and being appointed. So let's deal with both of those. The first one is this. We are chosen to bear fruit. I think that is one of kind of the big things. And the whole passage is about bearing fruit, but there's really the passion that flows into the appointing. And the passion comes from the fact that we are chosen. This whole concept of abide, I believe, plays out in crystal clarity when we think about Jesus' words here that he chose us. And when you think about the disciples, you're talking about a bunch of guys who were tax collectors and fishermen that had probably failed out of rabbi school already. Somebody else didn't want them. They, they, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes by and says, no, I have chosen you. This is the big difference between religion and the gospel. Religion says, choose Jesus, and maybe he'll choose you. The gospel says, choose, uh, the gospel says Jesus has chosen you to be his friend. I hope week four of the Abide series I hope that maybe some of us are newer to this concept, are beginning to catch it as we keep circling it. That many times religion says, and it can be across the world, it can be right here, deep fried in the South, okay? It can be right here where it is, you go bear fruit, you be good, you deny the world, you do everything right, you be very moral, and one day you might just get Jesus. That is religion, And Jesus fully knows that our hearts are wired for that, that we go to that. We don't like the concept of grace. Uh, You know, we we don't like it. What we want is to be able to, hey, I dug this hole. I want to dig myself out of this hole. I'm going to keep working hard, and then I will become acceptable, worthy, lovable, beautiful on my own, and God will accept me. Jesus Christ, in an instant, reverses the burden here, the initiative here. You don't clean yourself up and bear a bunch of fruit to get the vine. I choose you. You have the vine. And now you are able to go and bear fruit. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but, you know, at some point, and especially if you're skeptical today, especially if you're like, man, I'm not a believer. I'm just kind of checking things out. At some point, you've got to lay all of the religions of the world, whether they're across the world or they're right here in the South, even if they're saying Jesus and all this, but the idea is you do, therefore you're accepted, you got to lay all the religions of the world against the gospel and see what is the difference in the two. Man, I've been with teams that have preached the gospel really all over the world. Massive cities in Turkey, fishing villages in Indonesia, um, the countryside of Peru, Nicaragua, the slums of Santo Domingo. I mean, I've been all over and I have been able to see and I've confirmed with my own eyes. This is sort of what you end up having. Whether it is Islam, whether it is animism, whether it is some kind of weird brands of Catholicism that happen that are mixtures. Of, of, of folk religion and all this all around the world, you end up, or rather it's religion, deep fried here in the South. What you end up with is if you can do X amount of things, then one day God might just accept you in the end. Only the gospel on the other side says, no, 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 you don't do, therefore you're accepted. I chose you. I put you in the vine. You came in first. You cling to the vine. You abide in the vine. And then the fruit comes out in your life. I think Jesus is saying that to these guys and maybe through them to us. Jesus is reminding them, you didn't choose me. You didn't work real hard to impress me. I chose you and have been shaping you. You were fishermen. You were tax collectors. I told you to follow me so that you would see unbelievable things and I would make you into something great. You follow me first. You don't become great and see the unbelievable things and then follow me. You follow me and then I do the rest through your life. And I think that maybe what they were supposed to catch, I pray that we are catching it here over the last four weeks and maybe even today. I pray that we're catching a gospel-centered view of life. I mean, we've looked at it a couple different ways. We, Jesus is the vine, we're the branches, we bear fruit through clinging to the vine. That was one. 
Another one was that we don't lay our life down for Jesus in order that Jesus would lay his life down for us. That was a couple weeks ago. No, Jesus lays his life down for us first. He goes first, and then we become the type of people who will lay our life down for each other. And for today, what we're seeing is Jesus saying, you didn't choose me, I chose you. When you were unlovable, when you were still in your sin. Romans 5, 8 says that. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel that Jesus would go to the cross, take our sin, wrestle it to the grave, be raised from the dead, that we catch that first, that we are unworthy, but he has done these things on our behalf. That's the gospel. And I hope that we're getting that that's first and then the works come after, all right? Let me give you two quick implications of this before we move on to our second big point. Two quick, just kind of practical deals that maybe we can walk out of here with. Uh, The first one is this. Think about being chosen to bear fruit. The first one is this. Being chosen into the family is a greater motivation than fear. I've been trying to show you that throughout this series, that religion says, if you don't do the right thing, God's not gonna accept you in the end, so go and do the right thing. And I'm not saying that's not a motivation, but it's not a very strong motivation. And one day we're gonna realize, man, I can't do all this stuff and I'm gonna, it's gonna break and I'm gonna quit or I'm just gonna kind of give it lip service and it's never gonna get down into my heart. Fear is not a great motivator. Love and acceptance is the great motivator. Evidenced by, uh, I thought one good illustration was this. Uh, the guy who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, a guy named John Bunyan, if you've ever seen that book. You know, one time he was thrown in jail and they, they told him, they said, you keep preaching God's unmerited favor despite people's sin and they're gonna run around and do whatever they want. And he said, I keep preaching God's unmerited favor, his grace, his love, despite people's sin and they're going to run around doing whatever God wants <laughs> because they're going to realize because fear can get you to go so far but love and acceptance man for some of you that are in this room and for I mean for all of us in this room it should be the moment we begin to catch that because of the gospel our life is not defined by our greatest failures but our life is defined by his greatest victories when we begin to catch that all of the sin and brokenness, the ugliness that is inside of my character, everything I've ever done wrong or will do wrong was nailed to the cross and God sees me and holy as holy and pure as if I had never sinned. Man, when the addict, when we realize realize that the addict God God sees us clean, when we realize that through the gospel, the person who has had just, man, a crazy sordid sexual past, God sees as pure again, when we begin to catch that type of acceptance and love and what Jesus did to give it to us, our hearts are warmed in a way that fear can't touch. Love and acceptance, you are chosen to bear fruit. Secondly, being chosen into the family satisfies one of the deepest longings within humanity. I love uh, Tim Keller. He, he, he made this point that I hadn't really thought of before. You know, for many of us, we walk through life uh, in loneliness. And that loneliness is sort of a beacon that we ought to listen to to remember that God has created us in a certain way for relational capacity. This is what Keller said. He said, you know, most negative feelings that we have, they flow from sin in our life or sin that broke the world. Loneliness is different because loneliness, if you look at it the right way, it doesn't flow out of what's wrong in the world. It sort of flows out a little bit with what is still right in you. That God, even though we sinned, hasn't totally taken away uh, the, the Imago Dei in us, the image of God in us. We're not crushed. We still bear his image. And as we bear his image, we are people who have a deep, relational capacity. But here's the deal. This is the problem. Some of you might be in loneliness right now. You look to other humans to fill that loneliness. They never can because they will all, you will always be failed and you will fail others. We cannot, we cannot satisfy this deep longing that we have for relational capacity. You know, we have a deep fear in our life. All of us have the deep fear of not being picked on the dodgeball field or whatever at like, in like second grade. And you know what? That sort of just follows us the rest of our life. We sort of have a loneliness factor. We can sear that, whatever. Y'all, that is a beacon in your life to tell you there is a friend that is greater than any human. There is a friend that will never fail. There is a friend that has given you through his death. Remember what we talked about? That Jesus says, no greater love is this and I would lay my life down for you. We have the greatest love in Jesus Christ, the greatest friend and a guarantee of his acceptance, a true friendship. We are chosen first. That should give us a passion And that passion flows into the second thing I want you to see, that we're not only chosen to bear fruit, we are appointed to bear fruit. As I said in the intro, y'all, this passage is not, in this whole passage, John 15, it is not just about us. It is not just about God moving in us. It is about God moving in us 
that he might move in others through us. Look at verse 16 again. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. For much of this series, we have talked about what God is going to do in us, the joy in our life, the love in our life. But here, the passage turns and makes sure that we understand that fruit is not just an internal personality thing. It is also something that is born in others through us. That's what he says. You should go and bear fruit. You think about Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. You think about Romans chapter one, where Paul ends up saying, I wanna come there that I might bear some fruit among you. I I want to see people become believers through what God is doing in my life. I wanna see the lives of other people changed, that, that other people would become Christians through my witness, that we are to be people who go about our business in the world in a way that witnesses to the coming king and sees people's lives change. So this is all the way back to the intro. So let's get right down to it. That's fine and all, but it's also one of the toughest things about being a Christian, okay? And some of us might be like, man, I love this personal walk with Jesus thing and all the things that he's doing in me. I don't really like the public walk with Jesus thing and all the stuff that he's supposed to do in others through me. I don't like the idea that the call of my life is to share with the world what God has done with me so that they can see what God could do with them. I know this is hard for us, all right? The reason I know that it's hard in general, uh, one of the reasons, is I thought about this. My, one of my professors in seminary that kind of taught on this stuff, he just released a book. Just the title of the book shows how we think about this. The title of the book is... This is literally the title, How to Share Jesus Without Freaking Out. (laughs) That's the title of the book. And I think to myself, if that's the title, then we probably, as a believing body, we probably struggle with this in some sense. This passage shows us how to share Jesus, okay? Now, I know some of you might say, how does this passage show us how to share Jesus? It doesn't tell us what to say. It doesn't tell us what objections uh, we need to be ready for. It doesn't show me how to get into the conversation with somebody about Jesus. It shows me none of those things. But Andrew, you're saying that the passage shows me exactly how to share Jesus. Yes, this passage doesn't have all the models and it doesn't have all the tools that you need. And I'm not saying there's no value in those things. Actually, if you're in a community group at Mercy Hill, uh, we're gonna be talking about some of that stuff. What are practical things this week that we can do to learn how to share Jesus with those we love better. Practical is good. It's the 10%, it's the 1%. The 99% is the well from which you are drawing on. It is your passion for Jesus. A passion for what God has done in your life when it is ignited for God's glory. Nobody ever had to train you how to talk about your favorite sports team in a compelling way. No one ever has to train us how to talk about our kids' talents or a hobby that we have in a compelling way. We talk about the things that we love even when they are controversial. At times, we talk about them. And if we can have a passion in our life that is ignited for the glory of God, that God loves us, that he called us his friend, that he sent Jesus Christ to die to bring us back into a relationship with him, that when we abide, we see fruit. We don't have to muster up all this stuff to get Jesus. Jesus has given us himself and now we can go and bear fruit when we begin to catch some of that. Y'all, sharing Jesus and our witness, it becomes not doable, it becomes inevitable. It becomes something that will happen in our life, all right? Here's what I wanna do to close the sermon. Let me give you two quick thoughts to kind of really close the sermon And then I'm gonna give you two quick thoughts to close down the series, okay? So if you've been with us just today, this two are for you, come right out of the text today, and then I'll spend the last couple minutes kind of closing down the whole series for those of us who have been tracking for the last four weeks, and that'll be how we close our time today, all right? First one is this, just for the the sermon. If all this is true, deep glory, deep passion for Jesus being ignited in our life, then these two things I think are true. Number one, bearing fruit is not a possibility, but it's a certainty. I know that when I told you in the intro, hey, sharing Jesus can become a great joy for you. Some of you are like, that's just not the way that I am. It's not the way I'm wired. I'm scared to death to get into conversations with people. I fully understand that. But I also know that passion can override our personality. I know that you're, I know that you're wired a certain way. I'm wired a certain way. If you think to yourself, and this might shock you because I'm a preacher, okay, it's ironic, but if you think to yourself, like, man, I, you know, I just, I don't know how to talk to people and I feel a little awkward in conversations, y'all, I literally didn't go get my hair cut for five years because I didn't know what to say to the lady doing it, okay? I've, I've been there. I, I have that anxiety in my stomach at times when I'm meeting with somebody that is new, something God has kind of grown me in, but I'm wired that way. 
I can't really get unwired that way. But what I know is, even though I'm wired that way, a deep passion for his glory can begin to override our personality. Some of us are absolutely slaves to our personality. We take a Myers-Briggs thing or whatever, and we think to ourselves, well, this is who I am. This is who God made me. So that's it for the rest of my life. Oh, I'm an I instead of an E. Guess I don't have to share Jesus anymore. No, it means you need a deeper passion. It means we need to ignite the passion for God's glory. And when we do, it will overcome some of those things personality-wise for us. It's not natural for me. For some of you, you would say that. That's not real natural. For others of you, you're like, man, it is natural for me. Some of us, it's not. Either way, we're both called to this. And, man, if we're in the vine, it's something God is going to do. It's an inevitability. It's not a possibility. It's a certainty. All right, so let's go deep with the passion. Second thing is this, bearing fruit doesn't have a timetable. We think the students uh, of our church that are, that are all kind of making their exit this weekend, okay, for the summer, but we, we think about this. We think to ourselves, man, the students are the ones that have the chance to go overseas and, and share the gospel with people and all that. Why do we think that? Man, the scripture doesn't give a timetable for this. The scripture is giving us this idea. You will bear fruit if you are in the vine. It's not just our students. Man, think about all of it. Yeah, I'll speak to the students. Are you leveraging your flexibility in life, your passion, your energy? Some of you that have, uh, you're in the heart of your career right now. How are you leveraging your resources for the sake of the kingdom? How are you leveraging what God is doing in your family for the sake of seeing fruit, not in your life, but in other people's lives? Some of you are retired and you're thinking, man, I've, I've done a lot of these things. You know, what if I could cast a vision for you just to say, what if the retirement chapter of your life in terms of passion for Jesus and what you see in fruit in your life, what if that chapter of your life was far greater than the first couple of chapters of your life, maybe even overseas somewhere. The scripture says that we will bear fruit and that doesn't have a timetable, all right? Now, let me shift gears. I got a couple minutes left. Let me shift gears uh, real fast for the whole series. I know that some of you haven't been here for the whole series and maybe you can go back and catch up, but for some of us, we've been tracking for four weeks. I wanna give you two thoughts that just kind of shut down the series, okay? Man, not, not just big picture of what have we learned, but two things I think have been very poignant through this series that we might need to be reminded of just on a closing note as we go out, all right? So, so here it is. The first one is this. Two questions. Are we abiding deeply? Man, is there a love and a joy and a sharing of Jesus that comes not because we're trying to earn something from God, but because we know and value what we have already earned from God? I think for many of us in here, Today, as I'm talking about sharing Jesus, the natural reaction for us might be, okay, I'm gonna go pick up a book at the Christian bookstore. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that tomorrow I try harder and do better because I'm failing in this area of my life and I've gotta get better and I gotta try harder and I gotta pull myself up by my bootstraps. And I'm gonna give you an analogy here quickly. You know what that is? Many of us that think that I go to the sermon and I get fired up uh, in order that I can attack the next week. If you're doing that, it's a lot like having uh, air that you blow into a balloon. And every time you come in here on Sunday, I just smack you as hard as I can. And you get to fly for a little while and you soar for a little while till about Tuesday. And then you begin to just kind of float on back down. And really by about Thursday, you're just waiting for Sunday again to get smacked again. Okay, I see you out there. People don't like getting smacked. And, uh, and that's, that's sort of what your relationship with me is. It doesn't have to be that way. What's the obviously the other way that a balloon can fly? You take the air out and you put helium in. And then you just turn loose of it. And when you do, it soars on its own. That is the difference between religion and the gospel. Religion is I gotta muster and try and smack the balloon and see if I can get it to fly this time. And in the gospel, there is an opportunity for us to be internally renewed with something that is new. You abide in the vine and just turn it loose. And you know what? Yes, I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't discipline that comes, but, but, but in general, what we're seeing is, man, with the gospel, with my motivation, with passion and glory, I'm gonna kind of figure out how to do those right things. I'm gonna figure out bearing fruit. Bearing fruit in my life's gonna be inevitable. You say, well, how do I do that? You gotta be around in a place that you can become, uh, get in greater relationship with the Lord. You can abide deeper in the vine. I'm gonna tell you, it's so, it's so different. I'm gonna say, hey, you need to be reading your Bible every day, but it's not to earn something from God. You read your Bible every day, why? Because I want to abide deeply. And when I abide deeply, I need to be in service. I need to be around other relationships that put, push me to Jesus. As I get to know him better, as I abide in the vine, deeper and deeper, as I stay there, I will bear fruit. Second question, last question for the series. This is really gonna feel like a left turn if you haven't been here for a couple weeks, okay? But last question of the series, are we accepting or rejecting the pruning in our lives? 
that we might bear fruit. This is what I learned this week just as I was kind of wrestling with it. You know, for the last couple of weeks, we talked a lot about pruning. God lets us go through things in life in order that more fruit would come out of our life. And here's where I am. Be very vulnerable with you for a minute. For me, it hit me about Tuesday as I'm writing this sermon. You know, I'm fine with pruning when it's my life that is being changed. I'm fine with going through pruning when my kids or my family are becoming stronger and our character is becoming more Christ-like and the fruit of the Spirit is coming out in our life more. But I gotta ask a serious internal question when I say this. Am I willing to be pruned and go through something hard so that somebody else's life can be changed? Am I okay with walking through something that maybe brings deep pain in order that somebody else's life will have fruit that is born in it? That's a different question, isn't it? What the scripture is calling us to is a willingness to both, that God would prune us, that we would see fruit in our life and fruit in everybody and and the other lives that are around us. And as I kept just wrestling with that and circling that, you know what I realized? Many times we believe things about a good parent on earth that we don't also believe about God. I don't know how we get that. God is father. But don't we think about a good parent? Think about a good parent on this earth. When we think about it, what we think is, man, the parent is changing that child through pruning, not punishment, through pruning, discipline. They're changing that child's behavior, but it's not just for their sake. It's for the sake of people that are around them. Certainly Christian parents think like this. You know, I've got, a, I've got our, our, our third child, our second son. Uh, he is, man, he's two and a half years old. Strong-willed child to say the least. And his name is Benaiah. Okay, so that's my fault. When you name a kid after the guy in the Bible that killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day, then you're going to have a strong-willed kid, right? And so it's a little bit our fault. Um, But man, that is just the way he is. And as a parent, you know, you got to get him pointed in the right direction, young, because of that strong will. It's a blessing. And I I praise God for it, if we can get it pointed in the right way. I mean, he really is, um, you know, I I don't know, the kid is just a man child. Okay. When he was about a year old, I thought he was verifiably the largest kid in the state of North Carolina. He routinely cries at the dinner table because he eats so fast that he bites his fingers. All right. That's not a joke. I've never seen a kid in my life at two years old that takes his coffee black. That's, that's, that's not a joke. He has begun, the last two weeks, he has begun to call my wife Anna. He has begun to call her babe, okay? And I just let him. I let him do it. I mean, he calls her babe. He calls me old man. It just kind of is. Um, but I think about his life and I think about the, I think about the pruning and the direction that it takes when you got a kid that's got a strong will But as me as a father, when I'm looking at it, when I look at Benai's life, I don't think to myself, I'm I'm pointing him in the right direction and pruning him for his sake alone. It's for the sake of his eventual spouse, right? It's for the sake of those that he is gonna work for or that will work for him. It's for those that are gonna be in his community group one day. This is what it means as a Christian, Psalm 127, that we would shape an arrow so that it would eventually be fired out into the heart of the enemy, that we would shape these children, not just for their sake, but for the sake of those around them. And you know what I know in his life? It feels like he's being pruned sometimes. It feels like things are being taken away from him at times, not just for him, but for those around him. Is God our Father any different with us? We go through things, we're pruned. It's not just for our character. It's not just for the internal, the fuzzies. It's not just for us. Y'all, it's for those that are around us. We be- okay, here's the series in a nutshell, right? We bear fruit not, uh, not for the vine. We bear fruit from the vine. Not for love, but from love. Let's pray. Father, you are good to us. And Lord, we thank you so much that we have your word to continue to prune us and shape us and point us in the right direction. God, we bask in the fact that we are chosen and we bask in the fact that we are appointed. And God, we're just so thankful for that. Um, Lord, I pray that in the passion that we have over your love for us, God, it would, it would push us to be that way in loving others. God, that we would see fruit coming out of other people's lives because of what you've done in us. Lord, I pray over this whole series that we've been through, Lord, that we would be... Um, God, a people who are not living these Christian lives for something from you, as if you're an employer, as if you're Santa Claus. God, but we would be people who love deeply because you've loved us deeply and we would bear fruit from the vine. In Christ's name we pray, amen.